celebrate this moment. This is a moment that we will never, ever be able to recapture. This is God's time, his day, his minute, his second. God, we ask that you would do whatever it is you want to do in our, prepare our hearts this morning, God, to, to do whatever you, to, to see and, and experience whatever you want to do in us. Let us not be the same when we leave this place as we were when we came, God. Change us. Mold us and make us into what you have us to be. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, please. There's a song that um, all of us have known through the years. It's a song that was written for you and for me, really. Maybe for you even personally. Because it's without God's grace, we don't have a chance. We don't have any chance. But with his grace, we can be more than conquerors. So that's just for us to sing this together one more time. Amazing grace. so many times when if it wasn't for God intervening, I'd either be dead or lost. But because he loved me enough to save me during those times and rescue me, and because he loved me more than I even loved myself, today we can sit here and say, Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ lives and rules and reigns within our hearts. He rules and sits at the right hand of the Father. And there are two words that describe my feeling about that right now. And here are those two words. You sing them with me. Praise God. That's what we do around here. We praise his holy name. Children, you may be dismissed now to go to Children's Church. God bless you, children. You are the best. You are the very best. We love you. Choir is going to lead us in song. As they minister in song, continue to pray.
Thank you, Brian. I'd like to encourage those of you who are visiting with us this morning to just reach into the pew in front of you and pull out that visitor's card and just fill it out. The only reason you do that is so we can get all your tax information and we can get all of your uh, personal information and we can harass you the rest of the year. Might as well be honest. No, I'm just kidding. We just want to have a record of your attendance and it will help us if you have a prayer request to put that down as well. That way we'll know how to pray for you. One of the greatest opportunities of praise in every service is the offering. And you say, you got to be kidding. No, it is. It's a time where we're able to give back unto God just a portion, just a minute portion of what he's given to us. And I know you as well as Chuck and me and everybody here, we're all so grateful for what God has done each and every day in our lives. So we'll receive the offering with joy and with gladness. Ushers, will you come, please? As the ushers come, I <clears throat> want to remind you that you're not giving to any person. You're not giving to any institution. You're giving as unto the Lord. And that is used, whatever comes in is used to further his kingdom and to glorify his name. So, Father, we thank you for the privilege of giving. We thank you, God, that you are such a lover of us, and such a, 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 a wonderful God, a God who never, ever stops giving to us. And we give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Would you remain standing, please, and uh, turn in your hymnals if you'd like to 467. Hymn number 467. We'll sing just the first and the fourth verses of this great hymn, How Great Thou Art. Great to see everybody. It's been a great morning so far, huh? I um, think about Psalm 132 that I read this morning um, after we had uh, just kind of got going this morning with a lot of enthusiasm in the worship. And it said this in Psalm 132 verse 9, may your leaders be clothed with integrity and may your loyal followers shout for joy. So it's good. It's right. It's in the scriptures to shout for joy. So praise God. Um, it's awesome, awesome, awesome. It reminds me of what we were talking about in, in uh, Sunday school class as well. Um, in my Sunday school class, uh, Bruce leads one as well, if, if you've never been before and you're interested in know more, we meet in the women's Bible study room, which is over here, and Bruce meets up above, um, in the, above the office hallway. And we stole their last study, which was on heaven, and we talked about why heaven will not be boring. And you know how Jesus said we're supposed to pray that things on earth will become as they are in heaven, his will, his kingdom. And uh, hey, that's, uh, that's a good way that worship should look like when we're having fun and not bored in church. Well, it's, uh, it's the Lent season, Lenten season, a time where we're looking forward and preparing ourselves and focusing in even more than we normally do on the work of Jesus Christ when he was on the earth. And what he did on the cross for us and when he rose again on that first Easter Sunday morning that we're going to be celebrating in a few weeks to come. But we started last week with this series that I'd like to focus us on as we think about Jesus and who he was and what he did when he was on earth. And we looked and we saw this really programmatic verse in John chapter 1, two verses, that told us if John had to put in one phrase what Jesus was like to somebody who had ne never met him before, this is the verse that he would use. Look at it here. It says, the word, God's word, became flesh. That's Jesus. And he dwelt among us. He lived among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. 
And so over the next several weeks together, we're going to be focusing on stories throughout the Gospels, mainly the Gospel of John, where we see Jesus on display, his grace and his truth. And more than that, we're going to attempt and pray to see that God will allow us to not just talk about his fullness of grace and truth, but also to cap it off with what we're supposed to do, and that's to receive his grace. Grace upon grace. Maybe you've already been graced to know who Jesus is and encounter him in a personal way, but he wants to give grace upon grace. Grace in place of more grace. There's a verse in, the, in uh, James 4, one of my favorite verses, and it says, he gives more grace. Because that encourages me that, Lord, I need more grace as we sing about. Your grace is enough. Paul wrote that. Paul was an apostle. He was an awesome Christian, a leader. And he said, Lord, I need more grace because I'm weak. But when we're weak, when we look to him, we become strong. One of the things that I've been praying for the most when I've been praying for my kids, because I'm sure you all, as you have your time to pray, you pray for family members, probably chiefly among anything else. And one of the things I've been praying for my children is this, that they would have a personal experience with Jesus Christ, whatever that looks like. Sometimes it comes more through the truth route, and sometimes it comes more through the grace route. Well, you might think, well, sort of, what's the difference? Well, think about truth. Truth is something more that's to be understood. For example, you guys remember I've told you a couple of times about that Chicago Tribune reporter, right? Lee Strobel, whose wife became a Christian, and they were both unbelievers, not just not churchgoers, but, you know, categorically, definitively, I don't believe that God exists or that God's real or that Jesus is real. So Lee Strobel, this agnostic, his wife becomes a Christian. What does he do? He starts to research. He was a journalist. He was an editor. He was a legal guy. And so he starts to say, I'm going to look for the evidence. Is there evidence that this is true? And after all of his research, he becomes a Christian. And not only just, you know, somebody to fill a pew, he's writing books to try to convince other people through truth that Jesus Christ really is who he said he is. I think about a student that I knew from, who, whose family was from Jordan, the nation of Jordan, at Princeton when I was there. And he joined our Bible study. He was not a Christian. He had no Christian background, never been churched. His grandma, he said, would go to church, and when he'd visit her out in Colorado, sometimes he would go with her, but that was his only exposure. He didn't know anything about the Bible. And so he was interested to find out more. And so I said, well, why don't you just read the Gospel of John? It's a great place to start if you've never read anything in the Bible before. So he goes off, and we meet two weeks later over coffee. And so I'm like, well, what would you think? And I'm expecting, you know, he's got all kinds of questions. Well, you know, I'm not sure about this. Did this really happen? How could this be? You know, all these objections that you might think that somebody who's kind of a, a thinker, intellectual might have these days. And so he comes and he says, I thought it was great. I, and I said, well, what do you mean? You thought it was great. You know, I mean, like, you have any questions? He's like, not really. And so I'm kind of thinking, well, like, do you believe it? He's like, well, yeah. And I said, well, like, have, do you want to do what it says right here to receive Jesus Christ into your own life? And he says, well, yeah. <laughs> it's like the simplest conversation to bring somebody from a place of zero faith to fully trusting Jesus Christ and his primary route into coming into a personal experience of Jesus Christ was through truth. But I also think about grace, the aspect of grace. Now, truth is something to be kind of understood with the mind, although it's personal. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So truth is a personal aspect, has a personal aspect to it. But grace, what is grace? Grace is something not primarily to be thought about and understood, but to be experienced, to be received in a personal way. And that's the, uh, we're going to see both grace and truth in this story, but as we turn to John chapter 4 this morning, we're going to read one of the greatest stories, I think, in the Gospel of John in the whole Bible about Jesus coming to a woman, a Samaritan woman, a woman who was sexually promiscuous, a woman who was outcast in the eyes of so many people, especially people that would have thought she didn't have a chance to know God. 
And through the grace of the Lord Jesus, she gets a second chance. She gets an opportunity at redemption. Let's read her story, and then we'll come back to ourselves. All right, John 4, 5 through 30. It's a, it's a fairly uh, long passage. It's, the words are up here on front of, in front of you, if, or if you have your Bible, feel free to follow along. So Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Just time out there for just a second. Samaria, you got to know just a little bit, Samaria was kind of like a half-Jewish region. And so Jews, if you guys know much about oh, the Old Testament or Jewish history or anything like that, it's really important that you're kind of purely Jewish. You're not supposed to intermarry in the Jewish nation. And so the Samaritans were people that had intermarried with other nations. And so they were kind of half Jewish and half mixed. And so for them, that was a strike against them religiously. And really, their relationship with God could not be to the same extent, if at all, that a Jew could have. All right, so that's why this is important. All right, so verse 6, Jacob's well was there. That's Jacob way back in the Old Testament in Genesis, a couple thousand years before. And Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down by the well. Jesus was fully God, fully man. He got hungry, he got tired, he sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, that's about noontime, so it's warm. And when a, a Samaritan woman came to draw water at the well, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. So the Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, as I mentioned. But Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw the water with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir... Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband, and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man that you're now with is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do now, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For these are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. We'll pause right there for a minute. You can see Jesus kind of slowly walks into the deep end with this woman. He starts with such a simple, innocent question. Hey, could you give me a drink of water? He knows everything about this woman from the beginning. Nothing was a surprise that he discovered in the course of this conversation. Everything was a surprise to her as they continued to dialogue. And so little by little, she begins to realize hey, this guy is something more than just an ordinary rabbi with some followers. And Jesus brings her along, and she begins to understand a little bit more and a little bit more, and then Jesus drops the biggest truth bomb when he says, okay, 
go and call your husband. Now, Jesus, note, he didn't do this in front of anybody else. He didn't say this in order to shame her. He said this in order to come with truth. And this was the way that she could have her eyes open to realize that the person who talked to him was somebody that should really be listened to. Because he is more than just a person. He's more than just a wise man. He's more than just a good teacher. He's more than just a nice person to everybody that he meets. This is somebody special sent from God. And so she says, I can see you're a prophet. Okay, somebody who speaks on God's behalf. Somebody who's God's commission to share his word. And then he begins to tell her even more. And he begins to say that the, the way that things have been in terms of the way that we've had relationships with God in the past in the Old Testament are coming to an end. And there's a new era where it doesn't matter if you go to Jerusalem, to the temple to worship, or if you worship over here in this place, none of that matters anymore because there's an era that we're entering into which, where God's spirit breaks down every physical barrier. And every person who's always been ruled out in the past now has a chance to experience God personally. That even from a child, you can have a personal experience with God. And so she realizes the ultimate unveiling of this conversation is she says, she kind of, I think, offers a little bit of what she's hoping Jesus really is when she said, well, I've heard that a Messiah is coming who's called Christ. And when he comes, he's going to say everything, almost as if to say, are you him? And sure enough, I who speak to you am he. Let's pick up with the story as his disciples come back, verse 27, just then his disciples returned and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. A woman it wasn't the first time Jesus' disciples were surprised that he was doing certain things. He always kind of broke the mold. But they were too afraid to ask, what, what do you want or why are you talking to her? Then back to the woman, verse 28, she leaves her water jar. The woman went back to the town and said to the people, come. And see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and they made their way toward him. One of the things that we see in this passage is, yes, the, the truth of Jesus Christ, that he speaks to us. And sometimes he needs to speak a hard word. Sometimes he needs to kind of show us It'll kind of remove the veils and tell us things that maybe other people wouldn't tell us about ourselves. It's really true. Hey, what you're doing is not right. But it's not because I want to make you feel badly about yourself. That is never the intent of God. In fact, whenever you feel guilty and shameful about yourself and feel like you have no hope to get to God, you can guarantee that's always the enemy of your souls. Because his number one goal is to keep you away from nearness to God. But when you feel guilt about what you've done and you have hope that Jesus is the Messiah who can give you a second chance and redemption in your life and chance at a relationship with God, then you know that that's the truth. That's the truth that leads to life. And Jesus gives this woman an opportunity to grace and look at what she does with it. Sometimes, have you ever seen somebody that you know they need the Lord in their lives so badly. And yet, as you try to offer to them the solution to their problem, they refuse it. They say, not for me. Or, I don't want to have to do that. Or, I can't right now. Or, it's too hard. You see, the Lord does come to us, and he is the pursuer of our souls. And he's giving every person a chance at redemption, at a personal encounter with him. But there has to be a moment when you and I say yes to him, when we answer that invitation. And look at what it says, verse 28, a minor detail perhaps, I think it's something more. She left her water jar there, and she took off. That is abandonment. She abandoned everything about who she was right there in her water jar. 
hey, Jesus is, is, is worth messing up our plans for, isn't he? It's better to get him than to hold on to the things that we know in this life. Whether for her it was her job, it was the course of her day, perhaps it was she had other responsibilities. What if she'd be late back to work to her master probably? What would become of her? Would she get booted out? Who knows what could have happened to her? But she said, I'm taking a stand and this is an opportunity of a lifetime that I will not let anything keep me from. I'm going to leave everything else to the side right now so that I can go and bring other people to meet this man, this Messiah, this Christ. It calls for us to respond to him and not just to respond in a sort of ginger, half-hearted way. The Lord calls for us, if anyone would come after me, he needs to take up his cross and die to himself and follow me. There is a truth that the Lord is asking for each one of us to decide. And that is, will I put everything, everything, every relationship, everything else that I desire in my own life in second place and keep him as my first and only priority, that I'll do anything that I have to do to have him and to be with him and to keep him first. And I love the epilogue to this story, the way that it ends. Verse 40 through 42, so the Samaritans came out to him listening to this woman and they urged him to stay with them and he stayed two days, just two days, but two days with Jesus. I mean, that's like a lifetime with anybody else. And because of his, his words, many more believed, became believers. They said to the woman, now this is where it gets even better. We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. They came face to face with Jesus. And they personally experienced his grace and his truth over those two days. And they received grace upon grace. And as we as a church are, uh, as God is doing a work of redemption in our church, as God is restoring our church, the little church that could, as it were, try to get back on our feet, and God has brought us to a place of health and vibrancy spiritual life and, and numbers added and, and uh, all kinds of great fun things for kids and, you know, everything from just the fun stuff to the great times of worship. We've come a long way. It's been a work of God giving us a second chance. It's been for us corporately and it's been for many of us personally and individually. But God wants to give grace upon grace to receive, for us to not stop and say, hey, isn't it so great that our church has gotten back on its feet, but to continue to encounter the one that we sing about, that we worship, who is full, full. He never, when you pour Jesus out and you put the pitcher back down, it's full again. Because he's full of grace and he's full of truth. And we, each of us, and as a church, don't we want more of his grace and his truth? Don't we want to receive more? And here we are today. As we gather together in his name and he's here in our midst, now's the time to receive more. Another full glass. We, always, we get dry. We get tired. We need more. And so we want to transition to a time now for us to be able to ask the Lord to fill us up. And whatever it is, I don't know what each person needs. There are so many things that are unspoken, that go unnoticed on the outside, but that you know about and that God, is, God knows about. And this is a time where he's saying, my child, I want to give you this opportunity. Will you be like the Samaritans who leave everything and say, I want you? Will you be like the ones who at the end say, they urged him to stay with us? Will you have an eagerness in your heart to say, Lord, don't pass over me. Don't just bless my neighbor next to me. Don't just bless the worship team. Bless me as well. 
let me experience more of your grace and your truth. So I want to ask you, Bruce, if you'd come up and to the piano and just uh, give us some background music. I just want to ask us to enter a time of prayer and to ask you to just ask the Lord to say, Lord, fill me with your grace and your truth. And you, you probably know what it is that you need. And maybe you don't know what you need. Maybe you feel great and full and content. But still ask him, Lord, I want to encounter the one who is still to this day alive and full of grace and truth. And let's believe what he said, that he's here with us and that we can continue to receive his grace and his truth. Why don't we stand together and just close your eyes about your head. I'll just lead you in a time of prayer, but you be active in praying yourself and talking to the Lord. Doesn't matter the words you use, probably the more genuine and lacking formality, the better. And Lord, right now, Father, we ask that you will allow us to have an experience of your fullness of grace and truth. Lord, I ask that each and every person who's inviting you in right now, who's urging you, Lord, come to me. Let me receive from you grace in my life that they will begin to. Feel your presence if they need to experience grace. Or, Lord, that you will reveal to them truth if there's something that you need to show them. Just begin to open up your heart. Just imagine yourself taking off any kind of covering that's over your heart and over your spirit and say, Lord, come into me. Come into me in a greater way. Come and fill me with your Holy Spirit in a greater way. Come and speak to me in some way. Lord, let us know that you've been with us. Lord, we are taking on that promise that you are here with us. Come and manifest yourself. Show yourself to us. Right now, I'm trusting you for that right now. Show your grace. Show your truth to us, your people. Remember your children. Remember your promises. Right here in this very room, Quincy, Illinois, 12th of May, 2016, that we experience again a fresh fullness of Jesus Christ. All to Jesus.
is yours this morning to say, God, here I am. Take all of me. Whether it be for church membership, it might be that you need to be healed this morning. Praying for God to heal your physical body. Maybe you're praying that God would heal a relationship this morning. Whatever it might be, take that stand of faith this morning and move. Move mountains. That's how. Good time this morning in church. Why don't you say amen? Amen. amen. All right, great. Um, we'll be back here at 5 p.m. tonight if you want to join us. Stick around for some goodies um, in the room here next door. It's been good to be together. It's been good to be in the Lord's presence. Go in His grace and His peace.